So good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Stathis Kazifimiadis. I'm the coordinator of the EO4U project, which is the sister project of uh, OEMC. Um, and the um, this, uh, uh, there are like three presentations uh, aggregated in this session, um, dealing with uh, machine learning tools and uh, system support for Earth observation data processing and applications. Uh, first part, like an introductory uh, thing, will be delivered by me, then my colleague, uh, Vasilios Baosis, will follow from ECMWF. Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, Alexandros Kalousis will deliver the second part from um, uh, HESO, from Switzerland. And last part will be delivered by Vasilios Baosis from uh, ACMWF, which is also the technical coordinator, uh, the technical manager of our pro project. Um, so this is the um, list of partners uh, that we have on board in this in this project. Um, uh, with us leading the project, and as I said, uh, uh, ECMWF having the technical coordination role. Um, so the, the, the basic rationale behind uh, today's uh, lectures, I'm using uh, uh, plural, uh, it will be to discuss uh, two important aspects um, that we have been trying to clarify, to provide solutions uh, to. Uh, so two important aspects in Earth observation data processing um, one of them is the uh, the machine learning uh, tools, the intelligence which is integrated into the platform in order to allow uh, very complex processing uh, upon the data. Um, uh, while the second one is the system support, meaning uh, understand um, what the architecture behind the processing is, understand the issues related to data processing where all these uh, complex operations are being delegated to, um, what are the, the paradigms adopted for realizing this complex processing, processing workflows, um, uh, having uh, been able to manage the entire workflow from data retrieval from different sources uh, all the way to, to, to data visualization and actual use by the applications. Uh, so overall, we're trying to clarify, to set some light on these two challenges, complex data requiring complex processing to obtain meaningful results, something which is uh, directly exploitable by the user, and also scale, scale issues. So before going into the technical details, the nitty gritty of our uh, platform, let me just uh, make a short introduction. Uh, so we're planning to, um, this is an ongoing project, actually we're uh, halfway uh, through the project work plan. Uh, so we uh, are trying uh, to, to improve access to earth observation data um, offered by a variety of platforms and data depositories. Of course, Copernicus, the Copernicus ecosystem is something that we have uh, been trying to, to have us uh, uh, input into our platform, but also other systems that are around. Uh, we are uh, struggling to manage this heterogeneity through the components of our architecture. Uh, we are also planning uh, to integrate in the future uh, outputs from platforms like Destiny that has been also discussed this morning. Um, ideally, we would like to have a user sitting in front, uh, something like a an advanced user sitting in front of a terminal, being able to query uh, the different sources, heterogeneous sources, as I said, being able to couple uh, selections of these uh, data, of these sources into a very specific workflow, and finally being able to show what the processing uh, output has, uh, has actually been, being able to visualize results, or being able to fuel this information, this process information, into uh, applications to a northbound API. Uh, so my colleague, Alexandros Kalusis, will discuss about the machine learning ingredient, which is quite extensive, quite big uh, in our platform. 
uh, there are different aspects of machine learning that we are trying to leverage uh, here. For example, we also have uh, um, uh, an integrated um, functionality dealing with learn compression, uh, but also labeling um, and characterization of sources, etc. Um, then we have these uh, uh, paradigms that I mentioned previously in order to be able to confront the scale of the data processing. Finally, um, and as expected, we have the customer facing uh, uh, interfaces. We have the user, uh, user interfaces. Um, we are currently building uh, AR and uh, VR interfaces in order to be able to visualize things uh, coming out from the workflow, but also provide APIs uh, to external applications in order to be able to extend the usability of this of this platform. Uh, and also we have some uh, middleware, uh, high performance middleware, which is sitting between the different components, allowing us to efficiently manage all the requirements uh, that are there for processing, for um, storing uh, information, etc. So just a bird's eye view of the platform, we have, of course, we need to orchestrate everything here. So you see on the uh, left-hand side, this orchestration, it's an orchestration language um, that we are uh, basing our work upon. Uh, you, you, you can see on the uh, lower part of this slide, the earth observation sources. Again, we're using plural here to demonstrate that we are dealing with many different sources. And also we can um, attach to workflows some uh, in-situ data, uh, information which is not currently, let's say, in a um, uh, in a very specific um, uh, source, but has been required in order to to be able to fulfill the requirements of a particular processing task. Uh, then we have the processing infrastructure, where we are dealing with uh, fusion tasks. We're trying to fuse uh, information from different sources. Semantic and rotation and compression that I uh, said previously, and overall uh, knowledge management. And on the uh, upper part of this architecture, we have all these UI specific buzzwords uh, that are showing uh, a, vast, uh, a wide spectrum of functionalities of uh, options that we are providing to the user. Okay, this is the architecture with many specific uh, components uh, being indicated, like for example, Ranger uh, and uh, Kafka and things like that. Uh, that will be uh, elaborated uh, later on by my colleague Vasilis Bausis. You can see on the left hand side still the different sources of observation data, the ADAM platform from, from MEO uh, being uh, progressively. Uh, progressively uh, providing data into the workflows, and then it's up to us uh, with the core of our platform to be able to efficiently manage all this, the processing uh, of this uh, uh, data. Um, and on the uh, right-hand side, we have all these options about the visualization of information, how this information is to be further exploited after the potential uh, uh, intensive uh, processing uh, is to be exploited by another application. For example, we have use cases where uh, the entire workflow is to fuel another existing application, but with a diversity of sources and this uh, plurality of, of, of data. Um, things that I have already said, uh, we're uh, managing uh, many different sources. And the thing that the front end that we have uh, in order to be able to, to manage all these sources is what we call a knowledge graph. Uh, so we process um, uh, data uh, and we try to reflect all this information, items uh, that are uh, within the uh, sources themselves, the data sets in particular, we try to reflect all this information into a knowledge graph. This allows us to easily uh, drill down into the sources, being able to detect the actual uh, things that the user is really in need of, uh, and then um, connect all these uh, selections into the workflow, into the workflow which will be built uh, uh, afterwards. 
Um, you can see also here some of the um, uh, sources that we have planned to connect to and are currently the process of, of uh, connecting into our platform. Um, and also, as I said, stressed previously, we're also managing in situ data, meaning that we may have uh, information coming, you know, a standalone file or information coming from some, some IoT source that we can uh, provide into the platform, we can attach into the platform and let the uh, subsequent components of the workflow uh, processing, fusing, and then uh, providing uh, all this information to the um, user interfaces. Uh, <laughs> Again, the, uh, at least on the data tier, the knowledge graph is one very important ingredient which simplifies uh, the retrieval of information selection from the side of the user on which data source to or which data set uh, to use in order to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, fulfill the requirements of a particular application, et cetera. But also uh, due to the fact that we have adopted this data structure, we can also run uh, uh, different algorithms within the graph uh, in order to be able to assess similarities and things like that. Since the data structure is there, uh, that allows us to do uh, many different things. Um, then it, it, what follows is the machine learning uh, tier. Um, again, uh, this will be um, discussed in, in much more detail by my colleague Alexanos Kalousis. Uh, so we have models that allow the um, uh, processing or uh, fusing information, et cetera, uh, in order to be able to provide more advanced uh, output uh, to the subsequent uh, steps of the or stages of the workflow. Uh, finally, we have, sorry. We have this from the tier, again, with a lot of uh, options about visualizing, imagine uh, cases where we have uh, 3D distribution shown on a VR interface, or uh, imagine cases where you have a lot of uh, data being contextualized as a user interface uh, uh, in an AR device, whereby you, you try to, uh, you know, you are in the field and you have all this information being properly selected and fed uh, in front of you, being displayed in front of you. Um, uh, this is, again, the uh, kind of information that we can support, the kind of functionality that we can support on the, um, on the front end tier. We have dashboards. I have a few uh, uh, screen dams that will be shown later on uh, about how to visualize easily uh, parts of the um, output. Uh, that your workflow has already delivered. Um, we can there attach some analytics in order to be able to do aggregations and things like that. Uh, but also, uh, as I said, fuel the um, uh, VR, AR uh, interfaces and also implement. We're currently uh, integrating this and open your API in order to be able to provide this information further down the stream into uh, third-party applications that are attached somehow to the platform and try to leverage all these uh, um, uh, technologies that we have put together. Um, again, um, besides the, uh, you know, the workflows that we have, um, the user is allowed to set up, uh, we have also uh, what we called um, uh, marketplace where uh, all the things that have been integrated in the past that have been used in the context of the platform uh, can be registered and can be invoked again, subject to the needs of a, of a new scenario, of a new workflow. Uh, so uh, this is a standard functionality within our platform. So models, for example, that have been trained in order to facilitate machine learning processing uh, will be there. And it's up to the user to try to combine these uh, uh, Lego bricks uh, and try to come up with something which is, uh, you know, uh, quite meaningful uh, with respect to the require to the requirements and the application which is is planning to to, to deliver. 
of course, code that you can uh, somehow integrate in the workflow will be there, will be indexed, will be properly labeled in order to be um, uh, in order to allow the user to invoke all those reusable components uh, in the future, properly tagged. Uh, okay, uh, here we saw uh, our workflow editor uh, is something that we have built. Uh, uh, we have a plan for and already built in the context of, of the project. So um, that's the reason for uh, mentioning in the beginning that we have a more advanced user sitting um, uh, in front of, uh, uh, of a computer and trying uh, to somehow exploit the data sources, the variety of data sources that are already there, and also the uh, capabilities offered by the platform. So you can see on the left-hand side, this uh, uh, canvas, this uh, list of options uh, that if you try to drag and drop, uh, let's say in the in the canvas on the left hand side, uh, 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 actually the user will be required to try to specify their behavior. Uh, they have been uh, parameterized to, to a certain extent in order to, to be able to deliver more options to the user uh, and thus being able to, to meet uh, the, the, the exact range of, of requirements that uh, he's supposed to, to, to meet. So for example, here you can see a very simple scenario where some data source, which has been selected previously through the KEG, through the, the knowledge graph, is being connected through one of the paradigms, one of the, of the computing capabilities that we offer through the platform, which is the uh, function as a service and the final result uh, will be uh, shown in a certain UI. If you um, uh, try to um, uh, to tap into these uh, boxes, then uh, you can provide more information. You can try to specialize. You can try to come up with some bespoke uh, functionality, again, subject to the needs, to the actual needs that you need to cover. Uh, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, you have uh, more uh, detail, let's say, parts of this um, uh, capability where you can draft code, uh, Python scripts, et cetera, that you intend to use uh, somewhere in the workflow. So uh, again, we have this uh, visualization option, where, which is um, uh, a very easy way of visualizing some of the outputs. Uh, these could be uh, coming from, from aggregation functions, from things that you need to apply uh, in the data as they have been delivered by the workflow. So in the last uh, point, let's say in the workflow, you can uh, try to aggregate information, you can try to combine information, etc. You can try to, la to, to run uh, certain analytic functions, etc. and then uh, come up with very specific visualizations. Uh, more things here, you can um, also, uh, since we are dealing with this uh, workflow editor, you can easily decide on how to set up your, uh, your dashboard here. For example, you can put on the um, right-hand side, I don't know, a pie chart or whatever that is, and uh, try to combine that with the tabular representation of the data, etc. So uh, this is fully customizable. Um, so... Uh, before proceeding with the uh, more technical stuff, uh, I, uh, I would like to mention the um, uh, use cases that the project um, uh, is, uh, will be um, dealing with. Um, this is a very vast range of, of use cases, as you can see. For example, first one is dealing with personalized health. Then we have an ocean monitoring application. Uh, food security, forest ecosystems, soil erosion, environmental pests, and finally, uh, improving the civil protection activities, something which is, at least in my country, is very, um, is much required nowadays with all these disasters, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, okay, there are some, uh, there is uh, information here about the, um, um, the content of each uh, of these use cases. Perhaps you have also uh, seen these um, slides. 
uh, in another uh, another session, uh, like two days ago. Um, just an idea of how these uh, different sources uh, uh, should be combined through the platform and should be able to uh, provide the diversity of, of applications, support the diversity of applications. Also, I'm monitoring here, we also have this idea of blending information coming from Earth observation uh, data sources within C2 data, information coming from onboard sensors, et cetera, and trying to uh, provide all these, uh, an optimized plan about the, um, the, the, the a particular route of a ship. Food security, something which is uh, planned to take place in, um, to focus on Italian region, on the area of Sicily, where we would like to have uh, to indicate um, candidate um, um, crops um, uh, suitable for specific climate conditions or the other way around. Um, uh, monitoring forest ecosystems. Um, the soil erosion, a very important also uh, issue that um, uh, our platform will be able to somehow cover and also uh, the uh, potential spreading of, of locust uh, in, certain, uh, in certain regions. Um, again, you can see here uh, that ML is uh, uh, heavily leveraged. And uh, for example, we have outputs of uh, very specific um, machine learning components that are indicating where certain swarms uh, do currently reside and how they are going to uh, uh, behave in the near future. And finally, these uh, civil protection activities, improving uh, the efficiency of civil protection uh, activities. Um, let's go um, a bit um, uh, further and try to detail how these workflows are being set up uh, in the platform. Uh, as I said, that was more than obvious, I think. Uh, we have the user, which is sitting in front of what we call a workflow editor and trying to combine all these Lego things, uh, Lego bricks in order to, to come up with a workflow. Uh, so, um, okay, we can put in sequence all these different modules. We can um, uh, try to specify in detail what the behavior of this module would be. Uh, and then um, uh, the, 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 the user will be able to, to, to launch or better to inject uh, this thing into the platform. Then the platform uh, with um, uh, some controlling entities, like for example, a provision manager uh, will be able to receive this workflow design specified uh, and interface through some um, standardized uh, protocols uh, will be able to receive this uh, design. And then uh, it's up to, to the platform to try to assess where this is deployable. This can be used uh, within, uh, can be used and scheduled within the platform. So you have additional staff there that is allowing uh, the user, is allowing the platform to distinguish between different workflows that are uh, um, uh, intended to be run within the platform. Uh, and also uh, be able to assign specific resources to this thing, which is uh, ultimately going to run in the plat. So for example, you can see additional stuff on the bottom of this, uh, the, of this list that shows that, okay, all the preparatory work in order to be able to run the workflow is being done by this orchestration and these, uh, uh, these components. Uh, then, uh, at some point in time, we are uh, uh, launching the workflow. Uh, so we have, in the beginning, uh, something that we call the, initiate, the, the initial part of the workflow, which is a preprocessor, um, obtaining the information from the sources as uh, selected by the user as indicated in the uh, workflow elaboration. Uh, and then uh, this component is supposed to fuel uh, with all these data, the uh, components following uh, in the workflow. Then we have the fusion engine, which is something that we can, uh, we will discuss um, uh, in, I think, the, the, the subsequent slide. 
uh, ML staff, um, which is uh, again uh, going to be discussed by the my colleague. And at the very end, we may have also some components, um, some uh, very specific functions uh, that are going to be um, um, to work upon the data as they have been already progressed. Uh, through the platform and uh, operating in the so-called FAS uh, manner, function as a service. It's going to be a, a lightweight serverless uh, architecture with all these provisions about efficiently managing uh, more demanding big data workflows. Uh, at the very end, we, we may have um, um, the feed to the user interface all these uh, user interface options that we have uh, already discussed, uh, or we may um, also feed this information into Elasticsearch in order to be able to visualize things um, according to the needs of the user. Uh, so a few, uh, a few remarks about the uh, what we call a fusion engine, which is, uh, let's say, one of the initial uh, stages in the processing within our platform. Um, so we have uh, the very specific, uh, the detailing of this uh, uh, processing uh, done by the workflow editor. Processing here means aligning data, uh, trying to merge to different sources, etc. cetera. Um, all this information is, uh, since we are adopting this Kafka thing, uh, for passing information to and from the different components. All this information is uh, fed into the uh, system. Uh, system in this particular stage is being implemented by uh, means of kubeflow, uh, kubeflow flows. And then uh, uh, a, uh, another step follows with information again provided um, as means of control uh, to subsequent components uh, to the later stages of the workflow. Uh, oh. So here you can see more detailed information about the uh, fusion. Uh, the fusion, uh, a particular fusion workflow is already listed within the uh, marketplace. So you can easily browse through the list. You can select uh, the things that have been compiled in the past that better suit uh, uh, your uh, requirements. And then this is again activated through Kubeflow in order to be able uh, to, to, to detail uh, the processing. Um, the, the component itself can manage many different streams, requirements of different uh, users. Uh, this is something that uh, scales easily subject to the workload that it, uh, it needs to face. Um, and of course, this is uh, something which is agnostic uh, on the uh, kind of uh, processing which is placed in front or afterwards in the workflow. So uh, in, in any case, it delivers something which is going to be interpreted later on, for example, by machine learning uh, uh, module. Uh, this is how we build um, uh, one uh, Kubeflow uh, thing, uh, very specific processing being requested, uh, being required here. And at the very end, you can uh, use that in the uh, context of the platform. Uh, so uh, we can deal with many different types of data here, of course. We can do with uh, manage uh, deep, shape files, et cetera. And uh, as I said, you can align the data, you can clean the data, you can have some uh, uh, proper merging or blending uh, information here. And then you can uh, run your own algorithms, for example, NDVI calculation uh, or um, things that we have done already, like uh, crop counting or crop identification. These are some examples of um, uh, applications that are already there, that are already in the marketplace, let's say. So here we have um, a, a photo. We're also running here some <clears throat> models about the identification of a crop, the counting of a crop better. And uh, so we need to be able to identify different plans uh, in this particular setup, uh, which is the final output of this workflow. You can see that we're um, uh, supposed to read two different sources, 
then try to obtain information from these uh, sources, try to run some pattern matching, and then at the very end, being able to deliver the exact locations of the uh, plants in this particular uh, setting. And additional functionality provided through this uh, fusion component, uh, interpolation, being able to deliver uh, distinct values in a particular field, and then having some uh, spatial interpolation and delivering everything as a final TIFF uh, uh, output uh, from this particular uh, setup. So uh, perhaps Alexander can continue with his stuff. Give us a minute because he's uh, yeah, yeah, using a PDF. Okay, let's see where control L works here. No, it doesn't. Okay, so I cannot make it full screen. I hope it will be uh, big enough. So yeah, uh, what I'll try to do is a bit of uh, uh, an overview of uh, what we have been doing in the machine learning uh, side for uh, EO for EU. Um, yeah, okay, it moves. Uh, so I'm, I would say I'm a newcomer in uh, the EO uh, ecosystem, and it's the first time uh, that I attend uh, an event specific on that. Um, and I mean, it, it is clear that uh, it's an ecosystem that offers a lot of uh, challenges for, uh, for machine learning. Uh, data sizes and the generation of uh, data, the velocity with which data are produced are, are enormous. Uh, we talk about physical systems that have uh, extreme scale and uh, and complexity. Uh, today, I heard, I don't know how many different downstream applications uh, that were making use of, of the data. So it's, it's really an ecosystem that um, uh, provides a lot of uh, uh, challenges, ideas, and opportunities for uh, for ML. So what what we uh, aimed at uh, doing uh, in uh, in the EO uh, for you was to kind of uh, support this ecosystem in two uh, ways. Uh, the first one had to do uh, with addressing one of the main bottlenecks, if if you want, when it comes to the use of supervised machine learning in a meaningful way and that's the uh, labor intensive uh, annotation part so what we are trying to do is to uh, reduce uh, the amount of annotated data uh, that uh, will be needed for what we call downstream application uh, tasks uh, and um, in parallel uh, with that uh, we are developing uh, learned compression uh, models. Uh, so, so we go away from, from, from the standard uh, compression schema and we try to uh, develop uh, ML models for compression that are tailored to the data distributions that uh, we want to, to compress. Uh, on, on the same time, uh, I mean, as I said, there are too many opportunities. A couple that are uh, also dear to uh, me is the tight integration of machine learning with physics uh, process. And there are a lot of uh, formal descriptions of uh, such uh, physics process that, that appear in uh, uh, the earth uh, sciences, solving inverse problems and uh, simulations. But uh, today I'll uh, only talk about uh, the first two. So. Um, the first part of uh, of the talk will be uh, about uh, de developing uh, learning, to be more precise, uh, 
annotation efficient uh, representations which can be reused further down uh, the road. Uh, so uh, deep, deep learning models uh, need a lot of data. And as I said, I mean, uh, a big bottleneck uh, here is the annotation effort uh, that one has to put in order to train in um, uh, an effective manner uh, the learning models. Uh, just, just to give it, uh, an example, in, in another project that uh, is kind of running uh, in, in parallel with uh, EO4EU, we have to solve a segmentation task. Uh, and somebody has to sit down and segment uh, images that we are going to use after process training uh, data. And uh, each image takes around to, uh, one hour and a half uh, for it to, to be segmented. So uh, you can imagine the cost of, of uh, that process. Uh, so this is something that we want to reduce. And the, the way we have chosen uh, to go about that, I don't, I don't like, I cannot move much with this. I will take this thing with me. Um, the way we have uh, chosen is uh, using um, uh, what is known in uh, machine learning as uh, self-supervised um, uh, learning. So uh, it's it's an approach that ha has been uh, quite uh, popular, if you want, uh, uh, the last uh, six years, where, where it kind of uh, started uh, appearing. Uh, a bit less popular, as you can see, though these are old uh, 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 measurements. Uh, in the remote sensing uh, area. So there is, um, I think, a lot of opportunity. And from what I saw th this morning, um, indeed, this is an issue. Uh, in, in many of the talks that I uh, followed in, in the previous uh, sessions, they were talking about the difficulty of getting annotated uh, data. Uh, so this is what we try to uh, address. So let's uh, uh, give... Uh, the the big idea uh, of uh, how self-supervised learning, and uh, in particular, a technique that is uh, known as contrastive learning, uh, SIMCLR, uh, is working. So what, what we want to do here, first of all, uh, let me say that this is completely unsupervised. Huh? At this step, there is no need for label information. Okay. You just throw to the system data. No annotations, no labels. There is no sense of supervised task. This will come later. And, and as in a sense, we are not concerned about that. What we want to do is to learn representations of uh, objects that can be used afterwards in very different um, downstream supervised uh, task. So how does the method uh, work? Um, basically, it, it learns to, uh, to map objects that are semantically similar to the same representation and repel uh, the representations of objects that are uh, semantically dissimilar. And how does this, uh, how uh, is this achieved um, at, at uh, uh, the core of, of the idea, of the contrastive learning idea, is that I will take an image, I will perform different types of uh, augmentations, data augmentations, as we say, I might rotate, I might blur, uh, uh, I might translate, and I might crop. So I will have different copies of the same picture, of the same image. This is what we see here. And these different copies, they will be, uh, they will pass, they will pass from uh, a neural network. It has two basic components: a CNN and um, uh, a small uh, MLP that takes the output of uh, the CNN and uh, extracts the final representation. And what we want to do here is to bring close together things that are originate from the same uh, picture, close together things that are originate from the same picture and put far away things that come from uh, different uh, images. So that's the basic idea of um, uh, self-supervised learning and what uh, we uh, have completed doing is uh, taking self-supervised learning in uh, uh, Sentinel-2 
uh, data. So these are uh, a bit different from um, what we have been used in dealing in, in standard machine learning, namely because uh, they are much richer. Uh, here we have 13 uh, different bands, or we can have uh, up to uh, 180, I think, uh, bands when, when it comes to uh, simulation data, such as the ones that are uh, produced from uh, ECMWEF. Uh, while com conceptually, I mean, uh, go going from from three bands, the RGB bands that we have in star standard images to uh, uh, more, more bands, it's not such a big uh, issue. Uh, it has implications on the, the complexity of the model, uh, what kind of things we are able to uh, represent, and also with how we manage the, the mere size of the data. Okay, you, you have images that are uh, four times uh, larger, even more if you go to uh, to richer uh, structures. Uh, that means that in memory you can fit less training data. Uh, you, you have uh, smaller batch sizes when uh, it will come to uh, your training. Um, so the 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 central point in uh, having a good. Uh, uh, self-supervised representation is what kind of uh, rotations, uh, rotations, what kind of augmentations one can uh, uh, apply on uh, on the object of uh, interest here in in the images. So in uh, the, the original paper, uh, a number of them uh, were used. Not all of them. Uh, make sense for the Sentinel uh, data. Some others that were not used in the original paper do make sense. Uh, still, this is something that uh, we are also uh, exploring. What is the best set of augmentation that can uh, lead to a better uh, uh, representation, lend uh, representation. So if you want, it's, it's still uh, a research uh, question. Um, so, I mean, so, so far, there is no downstream supervised task. As I said, everything is done in a supervised uh, manner. So uh, we, can, we can train our deep neural network uh, in uh, an unsupervised uh, way using the contrastive uh, loss. Um, it's not so obvious how to evaluate the learned representation if you cannot evaluate it within the context of something that uh, it was meant to uh, used for. So uh, this is what we call a downstream uh, task. And um, the way we evaluate the learned uh, representations, uh, at least at, uh, at this uh, stage, is to use a large, a large connection, large collection of uh, annotated uh, data that comes from uh, Big Earth uh, uh, Net. So uh, this is a multi-label uh, classification problem. Uh, each image can have uh, more than one. Uh, each instance can have more than one uh, labels. Uh, altogether, there are 43 uh, different uh, label types, um, and we used uh, we use a, an hierarchy on that. So we um, merge the 43 to uh, to 20 classes simply because for some classes there were uh, very few. Uh, uh, instances, at least in, in the first take that we have done. So this is an example of uh, what uh, Ben gives. So experts sit down, they annotate the data, you see the different classes on uh, on the right, and you can see that some of these classes have uh, a very small uh, number of uh, instances. So what now we want to do is to take the representation that we learned in a completely unsupervised uh, manner and see how this thing fares when we train it with a very small amount of data on the downstream task. Okay, so um, how would how we do that? Uh, think of um, the self-supervised representation as a feature extractor, a powerful feature extractor. So now. Uh, we'll we work with a very small uh, data set, supervised data set. Uh, and the data set now will be represented, the data set, the instances will be represented 
uh, through the features that are extracted from uh, the previous uh, architecture, from uh, the SSL uh, architecture. Uh, so it's really, you can think of it as a feature extractor. Huh? I mean, if you know VCA, I mean, it's kind of the same way. We pass the data from through a filter and we have a new uh, representation. Now, uh, the simplest way of evaluating this representation is thus training a linear model over it. So somebody gave me the new representation, I go and I apply a linear classification model and let's see what it gets. Well, let's see what we get. Um, a more involved uh, way is to take all the beasts that we trained and fine tune it on this small uh, data set. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we will compare uh, against uh, networks of equivalent number of parameters that are also trained uh, completely uh, from scratch on uh, this small number, uh, small amount of uh, annotated uh, data. So this will be, if you want, uh, our uh, competitor, and there will be a gold standard. I don't remember where I have it. That would be uh, what's the performance I get if I use all uh, the available uh, labels. So all the things that we see here, for example. Uh, so if we go to uh, uh, the architecture, we used uh, the, the basic building block is uh, a ResNet uh, 101. Um, and wh whether we are on uh, the baseline or, or on the SSL uh, model, we use exactly the same architecture so that we are uh, really sure that we are comparing the same thing in terms, the same things in terms of uh, uh, complexity of uh, of the networks. Uh, so um, what we have in uh, uh, SimCLR, this is the, the SimCLR model, the X images, uh, applies um, the CNN, uh, the convolution uh, networks, and uh, the representation that we get here is uh, further processed by what is called, what is known as uh, projection head, which is just a small MLP, which gives the final uh, uh, representation. So this is the thing, the non-supervised, the self-supervised thing that uh, will be, that is used in uh, the downstream uh, task. So this is the SSL uh, component. Now, in, in the in linear probe, what happens is, that this part that has been trained, if you want, in the previous slide, now is kept frozen. So it just does the feature extractor, and we only train the small neural network now to match the labels that come from the annotated data. And in the fine tuning approach, all this thing is trained end to end again to match the small set of labels that we have uh, available. Train end-to-end, -end, starting from the parameters that we have learned in the self-supervised uh, uh, step. And the baseline is we take basically the same beast, and we train it from scratch, no SSL on uh, the same amount of annotated data. Um, yeah, some uh, comments on uh, the evaluation uh, data set. So we have something like 250K training instances, 120K for validation, and 120 for, for testing. And since we set to explore the annotation efficiency, what we are going to do is to check how well we are doing if we use only 0.1% of annotations of labels over this data. So 0.1% of this thing is 269. We're we only going to use 269 labeled instances now to do 
the uh, training. Here we are going to use 1,230, uh, sorry. <laughs> when I go at 1%, we're going to use 2,690 instances and at 10%, uh, 26,000 um, instances. So the 0,1%, if you want, re represents a, a very extreme case, not uh, unreasonable though, in terms of annotation efforts, huh? because uh, as I said, before annotating, okay, maybe for a classification problem it's easier. For segmentation, it's not that easy. Annotating one image, 1.5 hours, uh, 270 images one times 1.5, it starts getting expensive. Huh? Uh, and let's see what uh, we get. So uh, in in red is uh, the baseline. So these are different uh, measures. Remember again that. Um, this is a quite uh, imbalanced uh, problem, so uh, it's it's better if we focus on on the top row that represents recall precision and F1 measure over uh, the different uh, classes that uh, that we have, and you see that the two approaches uh, based on SimCLR uh, they have uh, a significantly better performance. Actually, uh, the full model can learn practically nothing when you have only 200 uh, labeled uh, instances. And uh, the performance of uh, um, the different approaches kind of matches when we go at 1%, and yeah, I mean, the, um, the fully trained starts having an advantage at least in terms of uh, recall when we go at 10% uh, of uh, uh, the training data. Um, an interesting uh, thing to keep in mind is that this, uh, the green thing, is just a linear model. Okay, it has very few parameters. It's a one layer, if you want MLP, or you can think of it as a logistic uh, regression, multi class uh, logistic regression, which matches or even exceeds uh, performance of the fine tuned approach and definitely of. Uh, so, so. What we have here is something that is very easy to train also. It doesn't require uh, significant computational uh, power. It's just a small linear uh, classifier. Uh, and yeah, this thing can be adjusted easily in all sorts of uh, downstream uh, tasks. As a reference, uh, we give the, the performance here below uh, that The standard approach, so taking the big thing and training it now in all, uh, in 205, only five, 10, <laughs> okay, and training it in 250,000 instances. So if you see in terms of recall, we are at 74%. Uh, so, I mean, we, we are not that much down or, uh, with respect to something that has been trained on uh, 250,000 insta instances. In any case, I mean, uh, we still want to f further improve the computational uh, efficiency by uh, looking, uh, that's not for me, uh, uh, what kind of uh, augmentations uh, can take us uh, uh, even further uh, in terms of uh, the classification performance. Um, yeah, so uh, the regimes that we are targeting is uh, uh, applications in which it's very challenging to go out and, and collect uh, a large amounts of uh, annotation data. As I said, a strong point here uh, is the fact that I can just use a linear model and train it on, on, the, expression, uh, on the representation that uh, we have uh, extracted with uh, SSL. And the performance uh, um, of uh, the fully supervised no SSL methods uh, starts having an advantage when you are in 10% of uh, the annotated uh, data. When it comes to the architecture, I'll come back a bit uh, at the end if Vasilis le uh, leaves me some uh, more minutes. Uh, the models that we trained are exposed uh, through an inference uh, server, and they can be used by any kind of application uh, 
uh, downstream. So one simply has to run the data, Sentinel data through uh, the inference server. They will get a um, uh, representation over which they can uh, build um, uh, their own classification, uh, regression, segmentation, any kind of uh, segmentation or uh, classification or regression, uh, even though we have uh, looking also at uh, segmentation. And the whole process, if you want, uh, consuming, passing data through uh, the inference server and um, uh, then uh, training uh, with the new representation on a small uh, annotated data set can be automated with the workflow language that uh, we have in here for you. So that, that, that covers uh, one part of uh, the things that uh, we set out uh, to, to do in the project. The other part now has to do with the size of, uh, of the data uh, and, and how we can learn um, better compression uh, models for Earth, Earth observation data. So our starting point is again, um, yeah, okay, I already said that. Uh, we'll work with uh, Sentinel uh, data. So um, a number of methods in uh, in, in machine learning, uh, have at their heart uh, uh, what is known as dimensionality uh, reduction. And we, we are trying to do this dimensionality reduction by uh, preserving as much information content as possible. Again, if I take the example of uh, PCA, uh, I do PCA on my data and I keep, I don't know, uh, the variables that explained 90% of uh, the variance in my data, I might end up with uh, a very small amount of uh, variables. Although in PCA, one cannot guarantee that what you are throwing away does not have uh, valuable uh, information. So uh, the path that we took to uh, lost compression uh, is based on what is called a latent variable uh, models. Uh, uh, these are uh, models that are uh, projecting uh, the original data to uh, a low dimensional uh, space. Um, and in particular, we are looking at autoencoders. So, yes, I have a, a picture here. Uh, I go uh, through the observation uh, data to a latent variable, uh, which is governed by uh, some distribution whose sufficient statistics are. Uh, functions of the original data, and then back again to uh, something that I would like that is as close as possible to uh, the original uh, data with the same idea, some kind of uh, distribution parameterized by uh, the z, uh, z uh, variable. And I want to do that in a way that I minimize the uh, um, the distortion, if you want, the distance of x from uh, x prime, uh, which is equivalent to uh, maximizing the likelihood of x given this uh, latent uh, variable. And at the same time, uh, I, I want to um, keep this I want to keep uh, the learned uh, uh, posterior distribution as close as possible to uh, a normal zero uh, uh, one distribution. So this is a very short uh, introduction to what is known as uh, VAEs. Yeah. Uh, and what I have here is typically uh, a convolution uh, uh, network and a transpose convolution network that takes me back to the original dimensionality. Uh, okay, we can skip that. Um, so this is the, the basic idea. So you have this latent space, which is uh, continuous. And some years ago, some people say, okay, let's turn this continuous uh, uh, space to a discrete uh, uh, data space. So we will quantize uh, the, uh, the continuous latent space, basically using clustering. Okay. It's, it's just that. We'll use clustering. And yeah, uh, later we developed a variant of uh, uh, the VQV 
uh, A, which also tries to act, if you want, in the distribution of this discrete uh, latent space so that it saves it better for compression. Uh, so let's see how the QVA works. Okay, so I have a picture. I should have put here something from uh, Earth observation data. And then coder, as we saw in the standard VA, maps it to a latent space. So uh, Z is my latent uh, space. And now what I want to do is each one of the vectors that I have in this tensor, in this latent space, I want to cluster them. I want to cluster them to a number of um, uh, prototypes, code words, code words that come from uh, a code book. And if I cluster them, then I can represent the tensor with a set of indices from my code book. Okay, so I go from uh, a high dimensional continuous uh, space to a low dimensional integer space, which I can use for lossless compression. And the clustering, the representation, uh, the encoding and the decoder are learned as we do, uh, almost as we do in, in uh, a VA setting because we have this new thing, this new guy here. So then, um, yeah, and as I said, we can uh, apply lossless entropy encoding. So one, uh, one of uh, um, the improvements that we, we did in this uh, basic VQV uh, setting uh, was to, to further control for the entropy of this uh, discrete space by uh, for the entropy of this uh, discrete uh, space. Uh, so we defined now a trade-off between the reconstruction ability of your compression to decompression and the entropy of uh, uh, the discrete space. Why the entropy? Because if you minimize the entropy, you have the optimal uh, compression. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, now I need to remember because this is uh, my guys that uh, prepared that. So there is uh, a certain complexity here when we compare to standard uh, RGB uh, images. So, so we have um, uh, structures that have uh, much more information. Now we don't have just uh, um, three uh, channels of uh, eight bits in each channel, but we have ten channels of twelve bits. Uh, so, if if you want uh, the raw uh, data side for uh, an image patch, uh, uh, is has one hundred and twenty pixels bits per uh, pixel. Um, now, if we go to JPEG, JPEG uh, achieves an almost perfect reconstruction, uh, uh, zero error uh, compression to compression, uh, when it uses at least uh, 50 bits per pixel. So, okay, almost half of uh, the original image. So why I'm saying all this? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it because the number of um, or, or the BPS that uh, uh, you put uh, as uh, desiderata directly affects the number of clusters that you have to define here. Okay, so uh, you see that if I want to have 50 BPPs, I need at least 202 on the power of 50 clusters. That's too much. Okay, it doesn't fit. Uh, in in the memory, so um, we uh, we had to find the solution to to make um, uh, k means uh, scale not linearly with uh, the number of uh, of cluster because this is obviously uh, uh, too much uh, two hundred on fifty, and there is such a solution. It's called residual clustering. Uh, again, I won't go to the details because Vasilis is after me. Um, what we are trying to do here is we repeat, we do the basic schema once. So this is my first encoding. And now I take 
the error vector and I repeat the clustering and I repeat the clustering and I repeat the clustering. So like that, I can get, if I have um, B clusters at each level and I have N levels, I will have B to the power N uh, cluster. So I can uh, scale uh, easily. The cost that I have to pay is only uh, a sequence of steps that each one of them is uh, linear. So basically, uh, I pass from exponential complexity to linear complexity. Yes. OK. So this is what happens in residual clustering. Again, yeah, uh, it's not so important. It's just uh, how the actual number of clusters that we need to have relates to the BP that we desire plus something that we call downscale coefficient is how much we reduce the dimensionality on the encoder step. Um, the good thing with uh, the residual clustering is that you, you train a model with a, a number of levels or clustering levels. Uh, and at compression time, you say, okay, I just want to uh, have uh, only one level, or I want to have four levels. There is no need to uh, retrain, and by choosing uh, the uh, the levels that you want to use in in your uh, uh, clustering, you directly determine the uh, bits per pixel. So, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so sorry, uh, very fast then. Uh, this is what we get with JPEG. This is what we get with uh, the learned compression. So especially in very low bits uh, per pixel, uh, uh, we have significant uh, gains in terms of uh, compression uh, rates, uh, error. And let me just close maybe with one of the images since, okay, it doesn't want, ah, I got it. Uh, Unfortunately, I cannot zoom. <laughs> Yeah, let's take this one. Uh, so what we do here is we match BPP with learned compression with JPEG BPP. So this is comparable. Here the error is uh, higher. Or we match uh, error, uh, uh, MSC error of our compression with JPEG. In, in this picture, I think you can see even like that, the artifacts that uh, JPEG uh, introduced, there are uh, vertical and horizontal uh, lines. The compression that we have is much uh, smoother. The same kind of artifacts appear here, but they're a bit less um, uh, visible. So what we have at the end is a, a significant compression uh, uh, performance that doesn't distort the images. It keeps very low uh, MSC uh, error. And some of the things that we want to do is if we are going to use this compressed representation for, for downstream uh, tasks, what is the information content that we are losing? Uh, but this has to be evaluated now in the context of specific downstream tasks. And I don't have time to uh, discuss these nice architectural slides that uh, <laughs> show how Which one? The clock. Eh? Ah, the clock? Yeah,
We have uh, 16 minutes, so I'm gonna go fast, but I'm gonna explain what we actually present here. Uh, before starting, explain the, I'm gonna explain the system behind the EO4U. So you have seen this uh, diagram before. It's uh, actually combines all the auxiliary uh, um, things that we need uh, to monitor the system. And actually, if we want also to scale, then from uh, the left-hand side is the input, the observation, we have the knowledge graph and the, uh, the platform that actually we retrieve data from uh, the various uh, data sources. We have the, the machine learning part that Alexander's explained before and the fusion that uh, uh, Statis uh, gave a brief uh, uh, introduction. And then it's the main system that uh, actually uh, runs the processing. It's a Kubernetes cluster and, uh, and OpenStack and, and, uh, and two different instances. I'm gonna explain uh, that later. And uh, the rest is uh, the message bus that we use uh, Kafka. Uh, sorry if uh, that is more technical, but it's actually the the, the machine behind the, the whole platform. And then we have uh, on the uh, right hand side is the uh, user um, interface where we have a, a graphical user interface, we have the workflow editor, we have the, uh, the API that is compatible with OpenEO. And then we have also all the auxiliary services like uh, uh, authentication, authorization, and uh, et cetera. Uh, the, the whole system is designed to be scaled uh, when we have uh, uh, additional requests from the users. And uh, it's for the time being is uh, auto scaled, but we have also plans to uh, do it even uh, uh, further, uh, more robust to, to scale and uh, shrink uh, when we have uh, no uh, uh, computation requests. So uh, this is uh, what, what I mentioned before is that these are all the services that are running. Probably you have seen all this, the same uh, logos from uh, Ranger Rangers, the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, platform that we use. So it's actually we're using two cloud infrastructures. Actually, one is uh, Wikio and one is uh, uh, Chinega. On the left hand side, you see what is running on Wikio. Uh, we have uh, direct access because it's in the is one of the core partners of uh, Wikio. And for those that are not familiar, uh, Wikio is one of the DSS uh, that uh, still exist. And actually they are run in parallel with uh, the new platform that is uh, uh, being uh, developed by uh, ESA, the CDAS or something like that. And then on the right hand, uh, on the right hand side is the system that run on on uh, Wikio, on uh, Cineca's cloud. And this is uh, the reason why we run it on Cineca is that we have also access to HPC and we can run also particular for the uh, demanding uh, uh, computation uh, workloads. So we have the HPC if we like to uh, run uh, some uh, training for machine learning. So all these uh, things are glued together and uh, managed together. And we, as I said before, uh, the, the whole design is in order to, uh, is in principle uh, scalable and uh, can accommodate uh, um, uh, users, many users. So just uh, because we are talking about the uh, cloud infrastructure, the, it's important that we, uh, have always uh, security uh, in mind. So whatever we do, it's uh, uh, security by, by design. We have a network segregation. We have different environments for the development, for staging, for production, for management. Uh, we have a, a virus access control. Uh, all the developers that use uh, uh, completely different uh, names, places in the Kubernetes clusters. Uh, all these are uh, managed by uh, security groups and alerts on the virtual machines on networks and. Uh, all these are uh, also of completely uh, separate endpoints for public, public facing endpoints, private, or if you have something, a mix. Uh, the good thing with uh, uh, this particular design, we have uh, applied the same in another uh, project that you probably heard uh, during the last uh, two days that ECMWF is one of the core partners. And, um, and we are following exactly the same thing when we deploy a, a uh, infrastructure software on the on 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 this platform. So the good the good things that uh, we we have we the same pattern is applied also to the other projects. So the Kubernetes uh, cluster is a typical uh, uh, Kubernetes, and we are uh, with Rainter managed with Rainter. We have a single point of entry for the users uh, uh, or the developers to deploy their system. So regardless if we use two different physical uh, separated uh, clusters, one in Wikio and one uh, in uh, Tineka. 
the, the, uh, the developers, they use one interface and then they navigate to the cluster that they would like and the namespace that they would like to deploy their service. So this is, uh, all these are, uh, we, we don't write things uh, by hand. We can reprovision the system from uh, scratch and we we'll deploy everything from scratch using um, uh, infrastructure as a code and uh, particular uh, Terraform and Ansible scripts and uh, Ansible tower as, as, as a backend to deploy the system. So a few things about the a knowledge graph, as uh, Stathis uh, mentioned earlier. So it's the main entry for and access the services because they are uh, the, sorry, the, the sources, uh, so it's, which is the main input to the platform, but also the users can upload their own uh, data to the platform. And uh, actually they the scan the, um, the, the existing data sets and create the knowledge graph. And then without going to the uh, data sources, the users can uh, retrieve uh, the, the endpoints that they, where the data exists, and then they can uh, create their workflow and then uh, manipulate or process their data, download, process, uh, run the machine learning uh, computation, et cetera. So the next thing is the we use sorts of visualization. We use uh, some uh, for grip visualization and NetCDF, which is the standard output from many uh, services in and also image uh, data, as we said before. We use also uh, open search for uh, storing metadata in order for users to be able to retrieve uh, data. And uh, so all these uh, logos are already known. Communication layer, uh, we have uh, said that before, we use uh, Kafka as a message bus or whatever uh, the system, uh, all, the, uh, all the components uh, communicate with each other through uh, uh, public subscribe messages in Kafka. Uh, all these are security. Uh, it's also with the uh, uh, in mind with the authentication for the uh, variable uh, virus uh, services. Uh, we have also all the load balancers. They have also uh, security uh, options, and uh, and then we use uh, actually we use a stream chain, it's an operator, Kubernetes operator. So we don't write everything from scratch, and we use existing technologies because it's easier to deploy it and. Uh, Streamline the deployment of uh, and configuration of these operators. We use also mini IO, which is actually it's a native and high performance storage. We use separate uh, in order to store data that we retrieve. We use uh, uh, that we retrieve from the data sources. We use uh, S3 packets, and this actually gives you the the uh, the, um, the capability to have multi tenancy in order to uh, actually provide also acid atomicity, you know, consistency, isolation, and your ability to the end user. So the a user A cannot see the what the user B uses, and this is one of the key comp, uh, co things that we would like to keep uh, separate the uh, various um, uh, processing uh, workflows. So observability, we use a typical, uh, typical um, let's say setup. Again, we use uh, operators. We we don't we just deploy the operators and configure the operators. We use a Thanos because it's an aggregator of uh, Prometheus, which is, uh, uh, you can keep a uh, data for a long time and actually it uh, very well with uh, object storage. And with the uh, Grafana visualization, you can query, you can visualize, you can have your own dashboards, et cetera. So this is more or less the, the, the backend to, to the modern. And the same also for observability, we use uh, the same thing uh, uh, industry standard that we gather a uh, logs, logging operator, fluent D and uh, fluent uh, bit. And we use also open search for persistent stor storage uh, for the gathered uh, log. So all these are providing uh, some flexibility in order to for cloud native applications that be uh, flexible, scalable, and uh, extensible. And uh, all these things are not that easy to 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 deploy, but also to orchestrate that uh, we, we, this is the main actually um, uh, contribution of uh, what we have to deploy it there. So the, the okay. resource registry is a knowledge graph database, so it's a, a high-speed uh, database that uh, uh, actually helps for security and data integrity and uh, designed for the uh, cloud. So this is just to, as a registry that we know what uh, services are running, what is their, their status so that we, in case that something uh, goes wrong to, to identify easily what is happening. And then the same thing also 
happens with the logging that we can troubleshoot the, any uh, errors. With open, okay, I'm very fast. So. Uh, serverless and uh, open pass stuff is mentioned that before we have uh, it's a uh, deploy driven uh, uh, functions with microservices so the idea is that we use specific functions to run some micro applications we use uh, we're going to use also some other uh, constructs to uh, when the users uh, they would like to run their own code it's a portable application uh, and platform for any cloud uh, or on premise in this particular case we run it in as an operator within uh, kubernetes and uh, managed by ranger uh, there's an a, 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 there's a UI, there's a CLI, and which is nice. So and the integration for many uh, programming languages. So if you have uh, any preference for languages, there. And then this is my uh, two more slides, and then I'm completing. So front end the uh, dashboard. So we have data analytics. So in order to, uh, uh, for decision making and policy makers, real time analytics with the backend that we uh, mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and we have also, uh, the, the dashboard is intuitive so that uh, the user can uh, identify easily the data that uh, he or she wants to uh, retrieve. Uh, the, 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 the next slides about the uh, web, uh, the um, workflow editor, which is, uh, you have seen that uh, before. And there's, there's also the web uh, XR VR visualization uh, uh, interface where when the, we have the data, the, the digital elevation model, and also the data, if the user uh, wishes, can uh, visualize that in a 3D dimension. And also the uh, data analytics and uh, statistical metrics that we can uh, provide. So this is the um, the entry. If, you, if a user would like to uh, create um, a workflow, pr process data, retrieve data. This is one of the uh, ways that uh, he can do it. As that is uh, provided earlier, uh, a user journey. And uh, this is more or less the backend of the virus, the, the main components of the platform that uh, exist and we currently being um, developed by uh, the consortium. And uh, soon they're going to be actually uh, available. Uh, this is it, and this is the last one. So I did not like uh, the previous speaker. I was fast and covered a lot of material. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's it. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, you have these seven use cases. Eh? For example, uh, food security in Italy is one of them, or the, the, the shipping thing. Um, how far are you um, with integrating these on this platform? I mean, what do they use? What are the benefits of all that you do? That's not fully fully clear, clear to me. Can you give one example? For example, on the, on, I don't know, the food security thing, what, what, what exactly? does this bring all to them compared to what I have today? Hmm? Yeah, but what is the status today? I mean, eh? did, did, uh, are they already? Yeah. Yeah, but I can imagine that all these things, for example, what yeah. you present yeah. is all done on on request of the specific use cases, no? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what we are doing is um, uh, you present the right uh, Uh, so they, they are um, uh, doing manual feature extraction uh, from uh, images, so uh, uh, 
variables that they consider important. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do now is take the raw image, the raw Sentinel uh, image, pass it to the feature through the SSL extractor and use that as a uh, feature for uh, doing the forecasting of uh, locust uh, movements. And uh, the other thing uh, which uh, we haven't started looking at, but I think it's also uh, a, a use case that uh, has a direct uh, interest in uh, in using the SSL is um, the erosion, the soil erosion uh, application. Uh, for, for which ones, uh, let's say we have a clear path on how the SSL is uh, useful. Uh, now, ha having said that, there are a number of other uh, applications that also have need for uh, machine learning, uh, maybe not for SSL. Uh, so what will happen there is most probably uh, creating machine learning workflows that are uh, more specific for uh, for this application using the resources of, uh, of the platform. So most of them are not mature if you want in terms of uh, ML, they're not using really uh, machine learning in uh, uh, in the current practice. So the idea would be to uh, support them in uh, bringing ML or advanced ML. I mean, in the case of Systema, they are quite advanced, so that makes it also very interesting for us to to work with them and uh, take it further. But nevertheless, the characteristics of the platform are not you know, exclusively dictated by the user, uh, the use cases, meaning that we have uh, managed to come up with a wider set of uh, capabilities in order to accommodate, of course, these seven use cases, but more than that. That was the initial uh, thing that we were pursuing. Any other questions? Okay. So thank you all for being present. Thank you.